Good day. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic we're going to look at the Tomei function. We're going to start, start by looking at the definition of the Tomei function, and we're going to see very quickly that it has some very interesting continuity issues. However, to actually examine these, we will have to go back to the original definition of continuity, and then we will carry on to look at the properties of the Tomei function. Having done this, we will then finish by looking at implementations of the Tomei function in various programming languages. Now, to begin, the Tomei function is a function that maps the real numbers onto the reals. Specifically, if x is a rational number, and it can be written in the form m over n, which is in lowest terms, that is, m is an integer, n is a positive, the denominator is a positive integer, and the GCD of those two values is 1. That is, the, there are no common factors, or in other words, they are co-prime. Then we will map m over n onto the value 1 over n. Alternatively, if x is irrational, we'll just map x onto the value 0. So for example, the Tomei function evaluated at 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves, negative a half, all equal 1 half. The Tomei function at 1 third and 2 thirds is 1 third. The Tomei function at 1 quarter and 3 quarters is also a quarter. The Tomei function at, say, root 2 is 0. Now, the range is the rationals. However, what is the codomain? What are all values in the range that have a value in the domain that it map onto that value. Well, in this case, it happens to be simply 0 and the reciprocals of the positive integers. So let's look at the inverses. What is the inverse image of 1? Well, every single integer n can be represented by the rational number n over 1, and the denominator is 1. Therefore, the Tomei function is 1 over 1, or 1. The inverse image of 1 half is, well, every single value that maps onto 1 half. 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves, negative a half. So essentially it's all integers plus a half. The inverse image of 1 third are values such as 1 third, 2 thirds, 4 thirds, 5 thirds, 7 thirds, 8 thirds, and 10 thirds, and so on. Essentially all integers plus a third together with all integers plus two-thirds. The inverse image of zero are all irrational numbers. No rational numbers can map onto zero because any rational number has a denominator and one over that denominator cannot be zero. This is a graph of the Tomei function on the closed interval zero, one. At zero and one, the value of the function is one. At a half, it is one half. At a third, and two-thirds it is one-third. At a, half, a quarter and three-quarters the value is one-quarter. At one-fifth, two-fifths, three-fifths, and four-fifths the value is one-fifth. Now, taking a look at this function, we immediately see that the function is discontinuous at that irrational point. Discontinuous here, here. Basically, it seems to be discontinuous everywhere. However, that's not the case. In fact, it's only discontinuous at the rational numbers. At every single irrational number, it's actually continuous. So here we have a function that's continuous at all rational numbers, no, continuous at all irrational numbers, discontinuous at all rationals. Can we show this? Well, that's what I intend to do. Um, the, Tomei func the definition of continuity is as follows. A function f mapping the reals onto the reals is continuous if given any epsilon, real epsilon value greater than zero, there is an epsilon or a delta greater than zero such that if we're guaranteed that any point x prime is within distance delta of x, then the value of the function x prime is within a distance epsilon of the value of f at x. So for example, here we have a classically continuous function. Here's a value x, here's a value f at x. If you give me any epsilon greater than zero, 
This defines an epsilon interval around the point f at x. Well, given that epsilon, I can find this delta interval around x such that all points on this interval are map into this epsilon interval around f at x. If you, if you give me a smaller value of epsilon, well, I'd simply have to choose a smaller value of delta, and yet all those values in that interval still map onto the range or within the epsilon interval around f at x. We're going to use this definition to show that the Tomei function is continuous at all irrationals. Now, discontinuity. A function f mapping the reals onto the reals is said to be discontinuous at a point x if there exists at least one epsilon greater than zero, such that for all possible values of delta greater than zero, there's at least one point x prime that is within distance delta of x, but the difference between f at x and f at this point x is greater than epsilon. It's further away. It doesn't matter how close you get, you can always find a point that's further away from f at x than epsilon. Here we have a classic jump discontinuity. The limit of the function as x approaches zero, as x approaches this point from the left is here. However, the actual value of the function is equal to f at x, and that equals the limit as the function approaches from the right. If I now choose an epsilon that is smaller than the size of this jump discontinuity, well, it doesn't matter what size interval I take of delta, I can always find a point in that delta interval around x such that the value of the function is further away from f at x than epsilon. Well, okay, what happens if I choose a delta interval so small that I don't choose this, can't choose that point anymore? Well, that's okay. I can find another point here. And again, the value of the function is greater. The distance from f at x is greater than epsilon. And it doesn't matter how small I make that delta interval, I'm guaranteed that I can find at least one point such that the value of the function at that point is further away from f at x than epsilon. Now, this is how we apply functions that are piecewise. This is how we define or apply continuity to functions that are piecewise continuous, as in this example. However, the Tomei function doesn't even appear to be piecewise continuous. However, we're going to use this, we're going to prove another theorem, and then we're going to use this definition to show that the Tomei function is discontinuous at all rationals. Now, what's that additional theorem? Well, given any non-open interval a, b, where a and b are real, a is strictly less than b, there's at least one rational and one irrational number in that interval. How are we going to prove this? Well, this is actually going to be a constructive proof. That is, I'm going to actually give you a mechanism that actually allows you to find an explicit irrational and an explicit rational, irrational and an explicit irrational that fall within that interval. How are we going to do this? Well, b is greater than a, therefore b minus a is positive. 1 over b minus a is also positive, and therefore we can take the ceiling of that value. That is, we can take the greatest integer, the least integer, greater than or equal to that value. Well, if I define n to be twice that value, b minus a is positive, strictly positive, 1 over it is strictly positive, therefore the ceiling is a positive integer, twice that, therefore n must be a value 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and so on. Now, by the definition of the ceiling function, n must be greater than twice 2 over b minus a. And with a simple, little simple algebra, multiply and divide, b minus a must be greater than or equal to 2 over capital N. We're going to use this fact later on, so just remember, b minus a 
the width of the interval must be greater than 2 over n. Now, I'm going to give you an explicit rational number. Given the, given the left-hand interval point A, I will multiply it by our integer n. I will then take the ceiling of that. That must itself be an integer. Onto that integer, I will add 1 and divide by n. That defines a rational number. I'm going to claim that this rational number falls in the interval AB and strictly within the interval. First, by definition, the ceiling of x must be greater than or equal to x. Well, let's take a look at this. Our integer, well, we can, by the properties of rational addition, this equals that. Using the property of the ceiling function, this is greater than or equal to that. Well, I can just cancel the two n's, so I get that it's this value is equal to a plus 1 over n. n is a positive integer, therefore 1 over n, capital N, is positive. Therefore, this sum must be strictly greater than or equal to a. So now I know that this rational number is greater than the left-hand endpoint of my interval. However, by the definition of the ceiling function, the ceiling of x must also be strictly less than x plus 1. And remember, by definition, 2 over n must be less than or equal to b minus a. 2 over n, capital N, is less than the width of the interval. Well, taking both of these, first we see that we can replace the ceiling of this with a value plus 1, n times a plus 1. That's strictly less than. However, I can simplify this just to be a plus 2 over capital N. But 2 over capital N is less than or equal to b minus a, so I can make that substitution. This is less than or equal to this value here, but a plus b minus a is b. Therefore, we get that the rational number that we defined must also be less than b, strictly less than b. So therefore, this rational number must be greater than a, less than b. Thus, we have defined, we can define a rational number that falls on the interval. Now, how about finding an irrational number? Well, first of all, let's have a few other properties. The sum of two, rational num of two rational numbers is rational. By the properties of rational addition, rational plus rational, we get a new rational. The sum of a rational and an irrational number is irrational. Assume otherwise. Assume that a rational plus an irrational x is still rational. Well, if that's true, I can solve for x, but wait a second, x just simply becomes this difference. And that difference is another rational number. But that means that x itself is also rational, which is a contradiction because we assume that x is irrational. This is a contradiction. The only assumption we made that was that the sum is rational. Therefore, that assumption must be false. Therefore, the sum of a rational plus an irrational must be irrational. All right. Third, we can use a similar argument to show that if x is irrational and we're given a rational number, then the product x times a irrational times a rational must also be irrational. Again, assume otherwise. Assume that that product is rational. Well, then, if that's true, x itself must be rational. Again, a contradiction. Therefore, the only thing that could be wrong is that the assumption that the product is rational, therefore the product of a rational and an irrational must be irrational. We also observe this by realizing that the int uh, rational numbers form a field. If you multiply or add any two rational numbers, you get a rational number back. 
On the other hand, it's also closed under addition and multiplication. It has inverses or multiplicative inverses for all non-zero values. For any non-zero irrational number, I can find another irrational number such that the product of the two is equal to one. Now, the square root of two is irrational. Therefore, if I divide that by two twice, capital N, well, that must also be irrational. Now, given that, given my original point Q, well, Q we found is in the interval. Well, if Q is in the interval, Q was greater than A and less than B, well, then at least one of the two irrational numbers formed by either adding or subtracting root 2 over n over capital N, oh, sorry, root 2 over 2 twice capital N, one of those two values must be in the interval. Now, because q is in the interval, we either have two possibilities. Either at least one of the two points, q plus or minus root 2 over twice capital N, must be in the interval, or q minus root 2 over twice n, capital N, must be less than a, and q plus root 2 over twice capital N must be greater than b. So those are the two choices. Either one of them falls, at least one of them falls into the interval, or at least one of them is outside the, op uh, or both of them must be outside the open interval. And of course, the negative must be less than or equal to A, the positive must be greater than or equal to B. Well, if this is true, if the second half is true, well, then it must also be true that the difference which is root 2 over capital N, well, that must be greater than B minus A. If those two points lie outside the open interval AB, then the difference between those two points must be greater than or equal to B minus A. However, root 2 over capital N is strictly less than 2 over capital N, and by the definition of N, Recall that n was twice the ceiling of 1 over b minus a. 2 over capital N must be uh, less than or equal to b minus a. So therefore, root 2 over capital N is strictly less than b minus a, but if both points are outside the interval, root 2 over capital N must be greater than or equal to b minus a. Therefore, contradiction. Therefore, the assumption that both these points lie outside the interval must be false. Therefore, at least one of those points must fall in the interval AB. And both of those points are irrational. Therefore, there is at least one irrational point in that interval. Thus, we have proved, given any non-empty open interval AB, there is at least one rational and one irrational number in that interval. Note this can be generalized to show that there's an infinite number of irrationals and rationals in any interval. Basically, I can just repeat the following process. Having found a rational in the interval, I can now find another rational in each of those intervals, and that will split the interval into four intervals, and I can find an irrational on each of those four sub-intervals, and then just repeat this process infinitely often, and that will give me an infinite number of both rational and irrational numbers. There is something cool in the sense that you can actually show that there are more irrationals in that interval than there are rationals, but that's way beyond the scope of this talk. So, we have that theorem, and now we're going to prove that the Tomei function is discontinuous at each interval at each rational number, and this is reasonably straightforward. Given any rational value, the value of the Tomei function is 1 over n, and I'm going to choose epsilon to be 1 over twice n. Not a problem. However, 
Now I have my epsilon interval around 1 over n, and this epsilon interval does not contain 0, because epsilon is 1 over 2n. But recall that no matter how small an open in delta interval we have around the rational number m over n, we can always find an irrational number x prime that lies inside that delta interval around m over n. So even though m x prime is within distance delta of m over n, the difference between the value of the Tomei function at m over n and the value of the Tomei function at the, at the irrational number, it's 1 over n. And that's greater than epsilon, which is equal to 1 over 2n. Therefore, we have, no matter, we have found an epsilon interval around 1 over n, such that no matter how small we make an interval around m over n, we can always find a point in this interval such that any irrational number, such that the distance is greater than that epsilon or lies outside that epsilon interval. Now, consider any irrational number. So that just proved that it's discontinuous at any irrational number because I just picked an arbitrary irrational m over n. But now let's consider any rational num irrational number x, where of course the value of the function is zero. So there's my zero. Now consider an epsilon greater than zero. Well, if I choose this delta, notice that there are a few rational numbers on that interval that have a value that is outside this epsilon interval around zero. I'm not going to draw the epsilon ball for negative because it's a, strict, it's a strictly positive function. Notice, however, if I make delta smaller, well, I still have a few points that are outside the interval, but as I make delta smaller, it seems that I can always escape any points that are outside the epsilon shell. So I just have to keep on making epsilon delta sufficiently small. The question is, how small do we have to make delta? And is it ever possible that we may not be able to make delta small enough so that the image of any rational number does not fall into this interval 0 to epsilon? Well, let's take that irrational number x. Well, let's let epsilon, or let's let capital N, now be defined as a ceiling of 1 over epsilon. Epsilon is greater than 0, 1 over epsilon is greater than 0, therefore the ceiling must be an integer greater than or equal to 1, and consequently epsilon must be greater than 1 over n. Now, I'm going to now consider the following values. I'm going to count for every integer from 1 to capital N, I'm going to calculate these two values. x minus the floor of n times x over n, and x minus the ceiling of n over n times x, the, x minus the ceiling of n times x all over n. I'm going to take the absolute value of both of these. Now, I'm going to calculate this for all values from 1 to n. So there are two n absolute values. I'm going to take the minimum of these, and I'm going to define this minimum to be delta. So for example, if x is equal to pi and epsilon is equal to 1 quarter, then I would calculate each of the following values, and I would take the minimum of these. Well, the minimum of these happens to be a positive value approximately equal to 0 0.1084. Now, this minimum exists, and it must be positive because x is 
irrational, this value and this value is rational. Therefore, none of these absolute values can be zero because these can never be equal. I have a finite number, only two twice capital N values, maximum. So I can take the minimum of them and that minimum value must be positive. So therefore, for any epsilon greater than zero, no matter how small epsilon is, is only a finite number of terms, and therefore delta must be positive. Now, let's take this value, delta, and take any other value. Let's assume that x prime is irrational. Well, if x prime is irrational, then the difference between the values of the function is zero, and that's strictly less than epsilon. However, let's say we have a rational number, m over n, that falls within delta of x. We have to show that the difference between x and m over n must be less than delta, and then we will show that 1 over n must also be less than epsilon. Well, remember that we chose delta to guarantee that n is greater than capital N. If we chose, if n is less than capital N, it would have already been a value beyond, it would be one of those minimum values that we chose from. So it couldn't be, it can't exist. If it's true, this n, this denominator, must be strictly greater than the capital N we defined in the previous slide. Well, if that's true, then this must be true. This must be equal to 0 minus 1 over N. Well, that's equal to 1 over N. That's less than 1 over capital N. And 1 over capital N is less than or equal to epsilon. Essentially, that means that we can always make a delta sufficiently small so that all values within that delta epsilon, that delta interval are smaller, have a value that is smaller than epsilon. We didn't specify anything other than the fact that epsilon must be positive, x must be irrational, and so therefore this can be generalized to say that the Tomei function must be continuous at all irrational numbers. All right, so we have defined and constructively, constructively proven that the Tomei function is continuous at all of the irrationals and discontinuous at all rationals. We will conclude with a few things. We'll start with a zoom in on the Tomei function, which is so cool. We will list other names of the Tomei function, and then we will finish with looking at implementations of the Tomei function in various languages and some other very straightforward properties. Here we have a maple animation showing a zoom on the square root of 2 over 2. As you can see, there are a number of valleys that appear, and at the bottom of each of those valleys must be an irrational number, a uh, rational number. Not only that, every single, every single rational number must be at the bottom of one of these values. However, the value of the Tomei function is going to be something that is non-zero. <coughs> Other names for the Tomei function include the popcorn function, the raindrop function, the countable cloud function, the modified Dirichlet function, the ruler function, the Riemann function, stars over Babylon, and in my MPC squared class at Guelph, uh, it was called the Christmas tree function. However, that's not what Dr. Holbrook called it. As for implementations, in Maple, it's quite straightforward. Given an argument x, if x is rational, just return 1 over the denominator of x. If x is irrational, return 0. Otherwise, evaluate x as a floating point number, or to a floating point number, if that result is a floating point number, convert it to a rational and return the denominator, 1 over the denominator. 
Otherwise, return unevaluated. We don't know what the value is. We can actually use Maple to create some very nice plots of the Tomei function without actually evaluating the function everywhere. In C++, we have a different issue because every double in C++ is a base 2 rational number of the form 2 to the 52 times x over 2 to the 52. So for example, 1 third is actually stored as this value, and that is exactly equal to this irrational number. If we try to evaluate the Tomei function at this value, well guess what? That's a power of 2, that's odd, therefore the Tomei function would be 1 over this denominator. Yuck. Technically, the Tomei function at 1 over 3 as floating point numbers in C++ would evaluate to a very small number. This is somewhat undesirable. We would only actually have values of the Tomei function that are, have denominators of powers of 2. Instead, I'm going to modify an algorithm from John D. Cook's blog, which converts floating point numbers into the closest rationals. And here's a function which essentially uses uh, Mr. Cook's algorithm. However, it's a somewhat simplified in the sense that all we're looking for is a very close rational and then returning one over the denominator. In MATLAB, it's really easy. Given any floating point number, call rat on it, it gives you a numerator and denominator, return one over the denominator, making sure that you use element-wise division. Now, other properties include the converse is not true. The Tomei function is continuous at all irrationals, discontinuous at all rationals. However, there is no function that is discontinuous at all irrationals and continuous at all rationals. The Tomei function is even Riemann integrable. So you'll recall Riemann integration, you define the Riemann sum. Well, you can calculate the Riemann sum of the Tomei function and you can show that that integral is zero. Okay, so in this topic we've looked at the Tomei function. It's a function that's discontinuous at all rationals, continuous at all irrationals. We review, reviewed the definition of continuity and we use this to make a constructive proof to show that the Tomei function is continuous at all irrationals and we proved that it was discontinuous continuous at all irrationals and we proved it was discontinuous at all rationals. We saw a nice zoom, we looked at some other properties, implementations, and some other characteristics. Thank you for your time and have a good afternoon.